Hi, everybody, from sunny and getting warmer Orlando, Florida. And uh, anyway, wonderful to talk to you from here. Greetings, brothers and sisters of the house of Yahweh, the house of Abba, our dear daddy. In a few weeks, we'll be remembering our Savior as we participate and partake of his Passover. We'll be washing feet. We'll be uh, uh, drinking from the master's cup of red wine. We'll be remembering our Savior's sacrifice for us. The Apostle Paul says in Galatians 2.20, in fact, that he had, he, Paul, has been crucified with Christ. And yet we know he didn't die by crucifixion. Why did he say that? What does that mean? I gave a similar sermon to this, I believe, uh, about eight years ago. This is a vastly different sermon, though maybe a third of it is going to be taken from the old notes, but but maybe not even that much. But I've come to understand it better, and I want to cover a different aspect of it. And in some ways, some of the things that are in the last sermon, which are good, I won't be able to have time to cover, so you still might want to hear that one too. I don't know. But um, what does it mean in Galatians 2.20 that we have been crucified with Christ? What does it mean when Yeshua says, Yeshua, Jesus, okay, you guys say Jesus, I like to say Yeshua, uh, the, his Hebrew name. What does it mean in Luke 9.23 when he says to take up your cross and follow me daily? What does that mean? And when you understand the depth of Galatians 2.20, I believe your life will change. So I'm covering this because we're in the season, the weeks just before Passover. And um, it's always good to have some meat and due season to talk about things. We're supposed to be examining ourselves as we come to the Passover, that we take it in a worthy manner. And so that's why I'm covering this today, is to um, make sure that we're thinking about the Passover season Days of Unleavened Bread, the Spring Holy Days, the plan of God as we come into that season. Crucifixion, especially that of Yeshua, who carried the cross beam. I don't think he carried a cross. I think he carried a cross beam that could have been attached to a tree or to a post that they often would keep in position. In 1 Peter 2.24 and other places, it does seem to say a tree. But when you look at the Greek word there, it can just mean piece of wood could mean wood, could mean tree, could mean a post. So it could mean tree, or it could mean just a post in the ground. Um, I don't think we should make a big deal about whether it was a tree or a cross, because they certainly did impale or hang people on upright post, their arms above their head, as well as with a cross beam out to the side, sometimes even with a, an X figure in the ground. So, I mean, they did it different ways. It doesn't, they were all called crucifixions. It doesn't matter, really, whether it was a beam, a cross, or a tree. The important thing is that my Savior, the Son of God, came and died for you and me, and he was killed on what they called crucifixions. I know in Acts 13, verses 28 and 29, Acts 13, verses 28 and 29, see, there are two Greek words used for um, cross or tree. One is stauros. S-T-A-U-R-O-S. That's the one typically uh, called the cross. And then there's the Zulos, X-U-L-U-S-L-O-S, I mean, which means a piece of wood or a tree. It can mean club. It can mean all kinds of kinds of wood. In Acts 13, verses 28 to 29, though they found no cause for death in him, they asked Pilate, you know, they're telling the story of what happened to Yeshua, that he should be put to death. Now, when they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree, Zulon, X-U-L-O-N, is what I should have said a while ago, X-U-L-O-N, wood, tree, post, whatever that was, and laid him in a tomb. Now, many have made the Passover lamb the core story when they talk about the Passover. I must remind you folks, the lamb was not the core story. The lamb, the animal lamb, pointed to the true story, the main story, the lamb of God. The lamb pointed to the crucifixion tree or post or cross or whatever it was. Remember to always keep the main point, the main point. Yeshua, our Savior, is the main point. The cross on Calvary starts the plan of God, most high, to redeem somebody 
anywhere in the world who wants to accept Yeshua as his Savior, all of humanity, hopefully, or almost all, from the grasp of the evil prince of darkness, Satan, Hasatan, the, the adversary, the, 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 the Satan. You know, in Roman times, criminals were crucified along the main road in and out of the city so that all could see what would happen to bad people. And in 70 AD, when the Jews rebelled and uh, Jerusalem was eventually conquered by the, reconquered by the Romans, and they burned the temple, sacked the city, all the rebels were captured, killed, many of them killed, and uh, about 100,000 men, women, boys and girls, children, were savagely nailed to crosses all up and down and around Jerusalem. They couldn't find any more wood to have any more. They couldn't find any more trees. This savage punishment is being done all over again to believers in Christ in Iraq and Syria right now by extremist Muslim savages who do it in the name of Allah. It's happening right now to people whose doctrines may be different from yours and mine but they're giving up their lives for what they believe. Yeshua was innocent, though. He didn't deserve to be crucified. So he became sin for us, like 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, to redeem us. This is the central message of Passover. Focus on it, and not on the Old Testament lamb and all of that. Focus on it. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For God made him, he made him who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So though I've spoken on the topic before, there will be some crucial updates in today's sermon. If you heard the previous one, I hope you'll hear this one. It's all about the blood of God's Son, Yeshua, being shed for us on a cross beam or a tree, And as we come to Passover, it's a wonderful topic to get involved in. It really is. Now, why the crucifixion? Why did Christ have to die by crucifixion, by such a horrible death? I'll give the quick version this time around, so I have time to cover the newer material. Uh, Point number one, the death Yeshua suffered. Why why did he have to die such a horrible death? Why couldn't God have just let him be uh, to die in his sleep or something like that? Well, the death Yeshua suffered had to be by execution. It had to be by execution as a criminal. Because the wages of sin is death. It's real death. It's not just a spiritual separation from God for eternity. No, it's real death. The book of Malachi says the feet of the righteous will will walk on the ashes of the ungodly. Okay, Yeshua really died for real. His spirit went back to the Father. And the body without the spirit is dead. In James 1.26, there are many, many verses that say he died and was raised again, rose again. So remember, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. So the wages of sin is not just eternal life separated from God. It is real death. So when Yeshua took on our sins, he had to pay the death penalty for our sins. He became sin for us, as I read earlier. He couldn't have just been put to sleep. He had to absorb all the wrath of God on him. On top of that, he was crucified beside two other criminals to enhance the guilt by association aspect of it, as well as to fulfill prophecy that he would be numbered among the transgressors. And that's found in Isaiah 53. It's all in my notes there. And one, and and picture this too. There were two, uh, he was in the middle of two. One of them repented. Uh, They both started out as taunting him. But then one repented and said he was sorry. And he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he represents all the people in the future who are who are going to repent and whom God is going to accept into his paradise and kingdom. And then the other one represents those who will not repent. And there will be some who will be cast into an ever into an ever burning lake of fire, uh, you know, and uh, they will be uh, burnt up. They will have to suffer the second death. But he was numbered with the transgressors. He had to be, and remember, when he took on our sins, the Bible says that he became sin for us. He who had no sin became sin. Became sin. He took on all the sins of the whole world. Of course he did. And so, um, point number one, he had to die by execution. And the executional death for a criminal 
back then was for slaves and criminals was by crucifixion. It was horrible. Number two, he had to die by shedding his blood. He certainly had shed a lot of blood already in the scourging, so that was fulfilled even by that. But I think you had to even die by shedding a blood would be even a better way to put it. But certainly you are without remission, without shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And we know at the end of John 19, verse 34, in the Greek it says that one of the Roman soldiers had pierced his side with a spear and immediately blood and water came out. He had to be dead already when the Romans came to examine the three and uh, because he had to still represent the perfect sacrifice with no broken bones or anything like that. So the second point, why he had to die by crucifixion, is he had to die by shedding of blood. He couldn't have just been stoned to death and knocked out, you know, that kind of thing. He had to die before the Romans could smash his kneecaps, as I said. And then the, the third reason he had to die by crucifixion, horrible way to die, is the way Yeshua died had to be painful, had to be brutal. To picture how brutal and painful sin's end result really is. Crucifixions were the most painful way that they knew how to put someone to, to death slowly. And sometimes they could last for days. And, and animals were, were picking at their bodies and so forth. They weren't, by the way, like you see in the, in the drawings and pictures, 30 feet high up in the air or something. No, no, no. They were right down here at the face level. They might have been a foot or two off the ground. That would be about it. Because the Romans were <laughs> lazy soldiers. And uh, they didn't want to have to make it difficult to get the body down. And uh, they, they would spit and, and throw rocks at and taunt and jeer at the person being crucified. Very often, of course, those things happen to our Savior. And so his death had to be a very painful one. And first, that you were scourged with a cat of nine tails, so to speak, full of metal and bone and, 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 and pieces of, of uh, uh, metal and so on that would rip away at your skin. They were not limited to 39 lashes because uh, though sin is has its pleasure for the moment, when you're committing adultery, it's fun at the moment. When you're getting drunk, it's fun for the moment. When you're lashing out at somebody in your anger and letting the words fly, it's, it, it, it maybe gives you a buzz in, for the moment. But the results are nasty. Now, the adulterer breaks up the image, I mean, the marriage, and smashes the family union. Brutal to everybody involved. Brutal to his own wife. May God forgive anyone involved in all of that. And the buzz of alcohol. You know, you, someone ends up losing their marriage or family or job or killing somebody in that alcoholic situation. Uh, many of us, all of us are sinners. And so many of us, I think, look a little self-righteously at our past and we think we're not that bad. Oh, yeah, someone had to be beaten and beaten and beaten and then tortured because of your sins and because of mine. Don't you dare minimize your sins or say you're better than anybody else's sins. There were many verses that say it was necessary for Christ to suffer and die. Like Luke 26, 46 says that. And many other verses I'll have in my notes. It was necessary for him to suffer and die. So it pictures what happens when we don't obey God. In the end, we suffer. And so he had to suffer to picture that and to remind us that there's a lot of wreckage in our wake. You know, if you're ever in a, um, in a boat and you're coming to... You're coming inland to, uh, you know, into a canal area in Florida. They have lots of these kinds of places. You'll see these signs that will say, five miles an hour, mind your wake. Be aware of what you leave in your wake. They don't want someone zipping down there at 40 miles an hour, you know, 40 knots or whatever. They, you don't, they don't want that because you're leaving a great big wave behind you, and that wave can cause some damage and problems. And yet all of us, I certainly have. All of us have left wreckage in our wake, if we're really honest. Uh, the, the time you lost your temper, you know, maybe you don't think that's as bad as somebody who's done a lot worse things, but we've all done worse things than we want to admit. And Yeshua's pain that he went through had to picture that. In fact, the word where we get excruciating comes from the word associated with the pain of the cross, okay? So that's why he had to die that way. He had to die by execution. He had to die by a criminal's death. 
he had to die by shedding of blood, and it had to be painful. I hope that helps a little bit. Now, let me make a quick point here. If you really understand, if you really understand that you and I also have crucified with Christ, have been crucified, it will be at times very painful and difficult to really apply that in our lives to have been crucified with Christ. So I just want to set it up for that. Hang on just a second. But that's uh, being crucified is a painful thing, is what I'm saying. And it will be painful for us to really crucify the self. Now, I'm going to change, change gears here a little bit. In the Old Testament, the Passover was foreshadowed by Melchizedek in Genesis 14, bringing the bread and the wine to Abraham. That was just on the very eve of the Passover. If you look at the context of everything that happens, and, and uh, it's, it's over a two-night period here at the end of Genesis 14 to the end of Genesis 15. He defeats the four kings who had captured Sodom and its surrounding cities, Adma, Zeboam, and Gomorrah, and the other cities. And if you continue reading into Genesis 15, it's clear that this was right after the Passover, like I said. And anyway, at the same time, Yeshua took bread and wine. And then the next day, there was a sacrifice of the cut-up animals in Genesis 15, uh, picturing the actual sacrifice of Christ. And then later on, we come to the Old Testament Passover in Exodus 12. Uh, and that was where every head of household had to pick a perfect lamb for his household. That lamb had to be killed. The blood was splattered by using a, basically a, a weed, a, a weed plant that has a lot of medicinal value in it, by the way, a hyssop branch, splashing the lamb's blood at the top and sides of the doorpost and lintels, the side post, uh, that you would have going into one's home. So I find it interesting that in Exodus 12 we're told to take a lamb in verse 3, and later it talks about take your lamb. So we have to grow in this ownership of the sacrifice that we cause and that we have to slay for our household, for ourselves. We take ownership that that's my lamb, that's my God sacrificing himself for me, as Paul says in Galatians 2.20, who died for me. Paul does it also when he says in 1 Corinthians 5.7 to remember that Christ, our Passover, not just the Passover. He wants us to personalize, God wants us to personalize this lamb, Of God, Yeshua, who died for me, who died for you. Not just for everybody, for you. So though we're remembering how he died for the whole world, make it personal. Now the blood was splashed with this hyssop plant, which is also the same plant they used to try to put sour wine into, give give Jesus sour wine and so on, and, and a sponge and all that with sour wine in it. Over the threshold... Uh, is where they sl- would slay the animal, and that threshold had a little dip in it called a basin. And uh, then they would take the blood from that and splash it onto the lintels of the door and, uh, and, and the post of the door above it. Of course, who is the door? Who is the door? The door is Jesus Christ, is Yeshua. John 10, verses 9 and 10. We enter into his presence through his blood. Now, the cross had had blood at the top of the lintel, no doubt where his head would have been. And also, as he puts his hands out to the sides, that would represent the post or, you know, the, 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 uh, the upright post to the door on the sides. And so even that action in, Ex, in, in Exodus 12 was picturing the cross. It really is. This is why we glory in the cross of the Lamb of God, as Paul himself often said. So please don't hesitate to speak of the cross. I know the pagans took advantage, or Satan inspired pagans to use this, the cross symbol in their religion as well. I know that. There's a Madonna or a mother and child in many religions. It doesn't mean the Bible story isn't correct. There's a cross symbol used in ancient Egypt and Babylon, different places. It doesn't mean the Bible story isn't correct. So don't uh, don't go crazy because pagans or Satan inspired pagans to have similar symbols. Anyway, so Yahweh says when he sees the blood, Exodus 12, verses 12 and 13, when I see the blood, he says, I would, 
That's when I'm going to strike all the gods. The Elohim is actually the word there, small e for Elohim. The small gods, the, the gods of Egypt, and then I'm going to pass over that home and no one in there will die. I want you to notice something. God does not say, when I see all your good works, I will pass over your home. Though good works are necessary for us to live by. We're called to do good works, is what I'm saying. He does not say, when I see that, you're, have a, that you have a wonderful marriage and children who are well behaved, I will pass over your home. He does not say, when I see that you are keeping the Sabbath, and because they weren't, frankly, at that point yet, even keeping the Sabbath yet. You see what I'm saying? It's not about what we do that earns us salvation and protection and having our sins passed over, where we get the word Passover. It's when he sees the blood, the blood of the Lamb. Make sure you have come under the blood of the Lamb in your, in your life, in your household's life. We cannot ever be good enough on all our best behavior and good works to merit God passing over our sins. Period. We can't. God Most High, our Father, passes over our sins only when he sees that we're covered by Yeshua's crucifixion blood. So where should our focus be on? The Old Testament lamb? No. On him. In him. Not in all the rituals and the good works that we have to feel we have to do. I gave a sermon last spring, 2014, When I See the Blood. I recommend you hear that. And then we know that God so loved the world that he gave. He gave something, his only begotten son, to come and die for all who would accept him and that we would not have to perish but have everlasting life. God the Father wants to be a real father of a real family. That's why he says in John 1, verses 11 to 13, that everyone who believes in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Okay? And yet his own did not receive him. God wants to have a family. And so this Passover picture is the first step in being able to redeem. He's our redeemer. He buys us back. Satan has captivated, kidnapped us. And he's demanding a ransom. And the ransom is the death of the Son of God. When John the Baptist saw Yeshua, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's God's Lamb for his household. His bloods take away the sins. Now, then in Christ's day, in Yeshua's day, on the eve of Passover day, Yeshua passed around his cup and had red wine in it, not Grape juice, folks, come on. He had real red wine in it, symbolizing his blood of the new covenant. Luke 22, verse 20. That we have to take inside of us, cleansing our hearts and soul. We don't drink from a cup or vial. We must be cognizant and thinking of the fact we're drinking as you pick up your little vial or whatever. You know, if there are a lot of people there, we do it that way now. But still, you got to think that this is his cup. His cup. The difference is profound. But drinking of his cup was more than just drinking of his blood and wine. It also pictured being willing to accept whatever Abba, our Father, makes us go through in our life as a follower of Yeshua, as a child of his, the good stuff and the bad stuff. Drinking of his cup. Are you able to drink of this cup? Yeshua said to James and John, And to their mother who was trying to say, put him on my right hand and left hand, on your right hand and left hand. Are you able to drink of this cup? Do you know what you're asking for? What you're asking for is pretty, pretty strong stuff. Then Yeshua was illegally arrested, scourged, beaten within an inch of his life with a terrible flogging. And then they nailed his hands, probably through his wrist. That was still considered part of the hand in the Greek. Because, uh, you know, he was, nailed through, he was nailed to the cross and then also a big spike put right through his heels. That's where they would do it, not through the ankle, but through the heels. Uh, they have found 
evidence of that recently in archaeology. And it's prophesied way back in Genesis 3.15. It says, when he was talking to the serpent, he said that uh, the serpent would bruise his heel, but he'll smash your head. And so basically, in the act on Calvary, Yeshua demolished any claim that Satan had. However, bruise his heel. The heel, the part, of the, the part where they put the nail in, is the most sensitive part. You don't realize that, but that's where all the nerve endings of the foot come together. It's the most painful part of the foot, apparently. The Romans found that out, figured that out, and that's where they hammered the nail in. So please be turning with me now to Galatians 2.20. For many of you, it's a memory verse. But now, now let's understand it. We know Paul wasn't literally crucified, so what did he mean when he said, I've been crucified with Christ? And what did Yeshua mean when he said to take your cross? And so Galatians 2.20 and 21 say say this. Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. Now, Paul was alive. He was writing this letter. But I'm not the one alive. He says, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh... I live by faith of or in the Son of God. I live by faith in Him now, not, not, not faith in what I can do and overcoming I can accomplish, although you have to overcome. You will overcome if you have faith in Yeshua. Who loved me and gave Himself for me. I don't set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died in vain. That's what verse 21 says. Anyway, I found reviewing this passage this year has been very piercing to my heart. Even as I exult and rejoice in my master's love for me and all his brothers and sisters. So as we grow in understanding on this verse, please also remember again our brothers and sisters in Syria and Iraq in particular. As they are being literally crucified for their faith being literally tortured, beheaded, suffering for the name of for the sake of the name. Some of them are being sold into slavery. Some of them are being sold into sex and made to have that or they're killed. Let's be praying for them to be strong and let's honor God, honor them before God for their faith and sacrifice. In Luke nine verses twenty three to twenty four Yeshua says very clearly, Luke 9, verses 23 to 24. If you print out the sermon notes while you hear hear the sermon, it'll go faster and easier for you. Then he, Yeshua, said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, to to follow me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily. I think what Yeshua is actually doing is explaining what taking up your cross daily means. It means to deny yourself daily. And follow me. Whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. He can't literally be meaning to carry a cross around every day. I know some of you carry cross jewelry. I'm sure that's not what he means. In context, he's just mentioned before that that he was going to have to die. And then he says we must lose our life for his sake in him. So watch this now. And then in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 30 to 31, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 30 to 31, Paul says that he was in constant jeopardy and that he died daily, he said. I'm not sure that we today have any inkling of what it was like to be a Christian back then and the risk that they went through. Although Christians, again, in that part of the world are certainly going through a a, a ton of it, being beheaded, sold into slavery, and all kinds of things. So, Yeshua said to deny yourself. Paul uses the same term of denial when describing that as a child of God, we have to deny ourselves the many pulls of the flesh that we want to do because we still have a carnal nature as well as God's spirit. In Titus 2, verses 11 to 14, Titus 2, verses 11 to 14. For by the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. 
we should live soberly, righteously, and godly, and and how God is preparing and purifying for himself his own special people. So denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. That hurts sometimes to have to give up something you know is going to be fun, like getting drunk. Someone, you know, I've I've never in my life ever gotten so drunk that I, I'm sure I've drunk too much in my life, but I've never gotten so drunk that I was throwing up and sick all night. I never have, but I can't imagine that that was <laughs> that that's any fun. I've done a lot of other things, but not that. So Paul equates what Yeshua says about denying ourselves with denying the pulls of the flesh. Fighting those things by the power of the Holy Spirit God's given us, even as we acknowledge that he is the one redeeming us, he's the one purifying us. It's just too easy for us, I think, to be just giving in easily without fighting, without fighting these uh, godly, ungodly pulls, these worldly lusts. It's just too easy for us to, uh, let's say, watch shows that do not, do not reflect the mind of God, that might have a lot of violence in it or might have uh, some nudity or uncontrolled lusts going on, or to get involved in shows that basically are all about gossip or lying or everything contrary to God's laws and God's ways. So maybe we are, are not fighting enough the cravings we have to eat too much. So, you know, i got to work on that. I have a lot of weight to lose uh, or to drink too much. Um, surely, I should say also that many of God's people I don't believe are fighting enough the desire to spend hours and hours every week on Facebook. Nothing wrong with Facebook. Uh, spend some time in there uh, keeping in touch with people. But if we're on there every night, late into the night, every day, and, and literally we're spending hours and hours in there while denying that we have any time for prayer and Bible study, you know, seek you first the kingdom of God. I gave a sermon on that a, a couple months ago. So if we're putting those things above being close to our maker, that becomes a God that we're putting before God and could be a serious, serious problem. So Paul says being crucified with Christ has to do with nailing our old carnal self down, tackling sin. We no longer want sin as a way of life. We no longer want to serve it. So crucifying our natures means we're taking extreme action, drastic action, to finally nail sin down. It means we've declared war on our sin nature. In Galatians 5, to 25, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. You know, love, joy, and peace, long-suffering. And then in verse 24, Galatians 5, 24, it says, And those who are, who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires have crucified the flesh. Now there are passions of the flesh and there are also godly passions that evidence itself in enthusiasm and zeal. It says Elijah was a man of like passions as we are, but he was a righteous man, right? Fleshly passions have to be nailed down. Now in Colossians 3 verse 5, Paul says, through inspiration, therefore put to death the parts of your body, the sinful nature that you have with you, he says, that are on the earth, fornication. And remember, Yeshua said, just to look at a man or a woman with lust, even you women sometimes do that, right? Is to commit adultery. Any uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Which of us, who of us never covet, if we're really honest? God says, nail it down, put it to death. I'll bet it took considerable effort. Can you imagine just for a second someone trying to be crucified or about to be crucified? Imagine yourself. Okay, they lay you on the, let's say it's a real cross on the ground, and they're going to, if that's the way they did it, and then they're going to raise it and stick it in a hole if that's the way they did it. And are you just going to lay there quietly while they take your hands and pound a big old spike in your wrist or hands or whatever, and then into the most sensitive part of your feet and your heels? I'll bet they were screaming, squirming, kicking, spitting, cursing. I think most of us would be doing some of those. If some foul-mouthed Roman soldier was trying to 
nail you down to a tree or a beam and your passions are going to not go down without kicking and screaming as well. That person being crucified pictures the passions and things that we like to do. And you've got to make a list of the things that you still have that you've got to tackle. That squirming convict represents our fleshly passions and desires that have to be nailed down. It won't be easy. Our passions don't want to get nailed down, so they'll kick and scream and fight. So don't think nailing your wrong passions and sinful desires will be easy. What do you do that you know if I knew or anybody else knew, we'd be thinking, oh, no, that's wrong. And yet God knows. Yeshua knows. The four living creatures around the throne know. The 20 elders around the throne know. The seraphim and the cherubim and the millions of angels all know. There's nothing we're hiding. So we have to overcome through Christ, through the Holy Spirit. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I I hope we've all decided to have an all-out war against sin as we come to Passover again. We wash feet every year because during the last year we got a little dirty, frankly. And we're rededicating ourselves to living a clean life, to walking a clean walk giving no quarter to any prisoner. I preach to myself. This is tough to do when we're still like when we still like to have and certain like to do certain things, certain sins. Let's face it, I do too. But if you and I are to follow Christ, we have to come to love him more than the pulls of the flesh and through the power of the Holy Spirit overcome. And we're going to overcome by faith in Yeshua not by faith in our own ability. So what is it that we need to each finally crucify? What carnal desires do each of you have that you've got to put down? What sins are you giving safe harbor to that you're excusing? Come on, it's just not that bad of a sin. You know, remember Goliath was just a harmless little baby, maybe a big baby. But he was allowed to live and he grew up to be a big problem. Sins are like that. You might have some what we think are baby sins right now, but you got to get rid of all of it and commit all of it to God and nail it down. Paul goes on to say in Galatians 6.14, Galatians 6.14, God forbid that I should boast in anything but the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. By whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So we're crucified with Christ and we have our own cross and now the world has to be crucified to us too. Frankly, the world has many appealing things to it. We live in it, but we're not to be of it. Whatever means the world to you, you have to put God in Christ Ahead of that, he goes on to say, Yeshua goes on, Jesus goes on to say in Matthew 10, verses 37 to 39, that we can't even love our family members more than him. He who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who doesn't take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. And so on. So we have to... Whatever we, you know, whatever you feel is your whole life, your whole being. It might be your child. It might be your child or children. It might be your job. I doubt that, but it might be. It might be your pet or pets, your dogs, your cats. Don't let that come between you and God. So if your brother or sister or father or mother or wife makes you say, it's either me or that belief of yours, that church of yours, what are you going to do? Yeshua says we better have that straightened out in our hearts to know exactly what we want to say and do. We've got to get that exactly down. God has to come first. We have to nail down that part in our life. So first and foremost... I think it must be clear that being crucified with Christ means we have to surrender the self. Our own goals, our fears, our worries, 
And then we, God will, you know, once we do that, once, once we're willing to give something up, we'll find that God often gives us the desires of our heart. I want to focus now on making this very personal. Making this very, very personal. Let's see where we are. Boy, the time just flies, doesn't it? I want to focus on the personal nature of all of this. Focus on the fact that in Galatians 2.20, Paul says, who loved me. I'm crucified with Christ. I no longer live the life I live. It's Christ. Okay, who loved me and gave himself for me. This was done because Yeshua, the Son of God, loved you, loved me. Don't don't make it just that he loved the world. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. Yes, that's true. But he loved you as well. It's a very personal passage to Paul, and it should be for us. As you come to Passover this year and drink of his cup, remember he took the penalty of sin for you specifically because he loves you specifically. My brothers, my sisters, I don't know if we often enough personalize it like Paul did like that. Instead, we talk about how he loved the world. Let's personalize it. Turn out he's uh, Exodus 28. Last year, I gave a sermon about what Yeshua is doing as our high priest of the order of Melchizedek. In the last 15 minutes or so of that sermon, of that sermon, around January, February 2014, I went over scriptures of Exodus 28 where it so personalizes what the high priest Aaron did. Remember, Aaron pictures Yeshua, who is now our high priest. Every time he'd go into the Holy of Holies once a year, I'll summarize, and you can read the text below in Exodus 28, verses 9 to 12, because this has everything to do with how he loves you, okay? Exodus 28, verses 9 to 12. There were two onyx stones that were carved with the names of the 12 tribes, six on each one. And remember, we are all grafted into the tribes of Israel today, spiritual tribes of Israel. So you're part of those names, six of them on one shoulder, six of them on the other shoulder. And every time he would go in, he's carrying them on his shoulder. That's in Exodus 28. I want you to read that yourself, verses 9 to 12. It's in my notes. And they were engraved on stone and on the shoulders of the ephod. So it ends up by saying there in verse 12 or 13 or so, it says, And so Aaron, at the end of verse 12, Exodus 28, verse 12, So Aaron shall bear their names before Yahweh on his two shoulders, Remember where it says the Lord in all caps, that's Y-H-V-H or Yahweh, on his two shoulders as a memorial. You are now a part of the Israel of God. You're included in that. Your name has been engraved, and you are being carried by Yeshua on his shoulders. And remember right now, our high priest today, that's why such a better covenant, doesn't come just once a year in fear. No, he's right there beside the mercy seat of God Most High all the time. And he's pleading in your case and carrying you on his shoulders all the time. Okay, you got that? I think that's very, very important that we get that. All the time you are being carried on his shoulders. What a wonderful God we have. And then in Exodus 28, verses 29 to 30, again picturing the high priest who pictured Christ. We're told that there were also now 12 stones on the breastplate of judgment that Aaron would wear over his heart. Specifically says over his heart. Exodus 28, verses 29 to 30. When he enters the most holy place as a memorial continually. And it ends by saying, so Aaron shall bear, listen carefully, so Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before Yahweh continually. Again, remember you are spiritual Israelite in Christ and your name is carried not just on his shoulders where he's carrying your load for you. Come to me, all you who are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest, he said in one place. Now it says here in Exodus 28, verses 29 and 30, that... He also is carrying you over his heart. Let me just read it. Exodus 28, 29 to 30. 
Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel on the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he goes into the most into the holy place as a memorial before Yahweh continually. And you shall put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes be, in before Yahweh. So Aaron shall bear the judgment. Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel over his heart before Yahweh continually, continually, continually. Aaron, read Yeshua. He's now our high priest. Bears the judgment, your condemnation. He took it upon himself. That's what Passover is all about, folks. And now get this. There are several scriptures that say God knew us, you and me personally, every day of our lives before we were even born. There are scriptures. I think of Psalm 139. I think that's one of them. That speak of being predestined. And that's not my topic today except to say is it possible that even there on the cross, your exact name was going through Christ's heart and mind. I think it could be, I think it could be so. Certainly the ones who are first fruits. Paul says he died for me because he loved me. And I want to take that sacrifice of Christ and apply it for yourself and that he bears the judgment for you continually, okay? Because he loves you. Now, how could Messiah possibly love someone like you? (laughs) Or me? Let's kick it up a couple notches. If you're like me, you don't always focus on Christ, but on your failures, on your past. Oh, yeah, I do that. I shouldn't. On your sins of the past on your weaknesses, on your regrets, and you end up getting very depressed. Maybe even worse, not only do you do that, but others do it about you. Others, maybe even your own family members, want nothing to do with you. Maybe you've lost some friends. Maybe because of your stupidity or sins of the past, you're truly alone in the world. Some of you hearing this might even be in jail, for all I know. So how could a perfect son of God love you? Love me. How could a perfect son of God carry you and me on his shoulders and over his heart and even pay the penalty for it when you know how bad you would been? Probably probably we're even worse than we think we are. Well, first, there's good news. We never see a verse where Yeshua was called the friend of, priest, of, of the priests and Pharisees. Oh, he was. Would have been if they would be. <laughs> but you don't find a verse that says, for he was a friend of the priests and Pharisees. Some became his friend later on. But the verse, Paul was a Pharisee. So you see what I mean? But the verse isn't there. But we do find verses that describe him as the friend of sinners. They felt somehow... They were able to feel, I don't know how, but they were able to feel somehow very comfortable around this holy man, even in his perfect holiness. Yeshua went to dinner with a Pharisee who ended up criticizing our master in his heart, and he invited him to dinner, and then, uh, but but he invited himself to dinner to Zacchaeus' home. And so uh, a very crowded, crooked tax collector, a very crooked, crooked, I mean not crowded, but crooked tax collector, and in that dinner, salvation came to that, to good old Zac. You know, Luke 19 is a story there. Have you been a sinner? Really, really a bad one? Well, if you look to Yeshua, he loves you. You know why? Because you know you're a sinner. Because you know you need saving. And because you know you need him. And he came to save sinners, not the self-righteous ones who think they're not all that bad. Our king, turn to Luke 7, verses 44 to 48. Our king, Luke 7, okay, when he went to dinner with a self-righteous Pharisee, had a so-called bad woman come in who wept and shed her tears over Yeshua's feet as she repented. Yeshua makes this classic statement in Luke 7, 44, 44 to 48. He turned to the woman and said to Simon, which means stoned, okay, Simon was the Pharisee who had invited him, 
and stone is not something pretty hard, okay? Do you see this woman? Do I see this woman? I'm wondering, what on earth is she doing here? How'd she get here? Of course I saw her. Anyway, I entered your house, and you gave me no water for my feet, but she's washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. You gave me no kiss. This woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with oil. This woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore, I say to you, stone, that's what Simon means, her sins, which are many. Oh, Yeshua knew. Her sins, which admittedly, he says, are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to him little is forgiven, the same loves little. The one who thinks only needs to be forgiven of a little. And then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. So if you're like me, and you've sinned a lot, I have, in the past. I don't want to keep doing that. And now you want to be different and have a Savior. He loves that. He loves you. He died for you. Because he loves you. Because you know, you know, you know, you know, you know that you need him. You know the horrible things you've done. Maybe unknown to most even. And because of that, he knows you love him. Because you understand how much of a sinner you are and how much you need forgiveness. And how much you need a friend. And how much you need a savior. How much you need a brother. How much you need family. He knows that. and He will be your family. The Apostle Paul saw what he had been. He realized he had caused the beatings, the torture, even death of some Christians. And after his conversion, you know what he said? His regrets were deep. But his appreciation for a God who could forgive and accept and love and befriend him and even use him was so profound to Paul. And yet he called himself chief sinner. So because he knew he'd been forgiven much, I assure you, His love for Yeshua just jumps out at us when we read every page of Paul's writings. Do you know you've been forgiven much? Do you really know it? I don't mean just say it. Do you know it? I know I've been forgiven much by Yeshua and my dear Abba, and especially at Passover. It's very real to me. I'm so thankful. I'm so grateful. Now, dear sister, brother, and Messiah, it's time we all start believing the same way, behaving the same way, as our Master does towards other repentant sinners who are struggling to change, who want a friend, who want to change or changing in spite of anything in their past. They want a brother, they want a sister, they want a friend. Frankly, that horrible sinner could be me, could be you. And would you say, if all your evil thoughts and deeds could be played out on a large screen for all to see, that you'd be so confident that everyone would think so highly of you? So let Christ live in you again by you becoming more accepting of repentant people, regardless of their past. Christ said to the woman caught in adultery just minutes prior, when he said this, neither do I condemn you. I have a question for you. That's in John 8, I believe. Would you have said that? But in the churches, we have people who will condemn people for their sins for years past their sins, when their sins were done. Years later, they'll have nothing to do with them. They'll turn to... I saw that happen. uh, Some horrible sinner had come to a congregation and a repentant man, a horrible sinner in the past, And a man and his wife, when this man sat down to eat, break bread with him, a man and his wife opposite him, got in, you know, literally turned their chair around, would not share, would not eat with him. But this man was a brother who had repented. That's just plain wrong. Those people are simply ignorant to the love of God. Ignorant. I pray they'll repent of that. It's not showing the presence of the heart of Messiah. It's just not. Do you remember the man in Corinth who had done those horrible things and had to be thrown out of the church for sensational open sex with his 
stepmother, whoever she was, but by the time we come to 2 Corinthians 2, uh, chapter 2, Paul is telling the church, hey, bring him back. The guy's repented. Don't leave him out there to stew, to get bitter. We know how Satan works. You can read that in 2 Corinthians 2, verses 5 to 11. He urges them to reaffirm their love for this man. You know what? It's so much e- easier to forgive yourself when your family does, when your friends do, when society does, when your church does. So let's be like that and forgive. Now, most of us uh, commit the same problem sometimes more than once, right? Remember when Yeshua was asked by Peter, how many times should I forgive my brother? And Yeshua said, 70 times 7, which was an expression meaning forever and ever, Peter. Not just 490 times, if I did my math right. Not just 490 times, but forever and ever is what it really means. And then in Luke 17, in Luke 17, verses 3 and 4, take heed to yourself if your brother sins against you, Luke 17, verse 3, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins again against you seven times that day, in a day, seven times, and seven times he says, I'm sorry, I repent, you shall forgive him. I promise you, I would have trouble doing that if someone did something horrible to me and I forgave him, and then six more times in the same they did it. Why did Yeshua say this? Because he knows we repent of gossip. We repent of losing our temper. We repent of being impatient. We repent of a lustful thought. And then we do it again. And again. Oh, we may not be out there killing people or literally getting to someone's bedroom, having sex with someone else's wife or husband. But in our thoughts, we are. Things we watch or things, places we go on the Internet. And God says, when we repent deeply, I forgive. The woman who committed adultery, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. But what if she had? Is the, would he not have forgiven her? He says 70 times, seven. He says seven times in a day. But we humans say, but if you don't change... Immediately, you haven't really repented. Well, take it up with Yeshua, guys, okay? Because that's what he says. And sure, certain things, we can't keep committing those horrible sins. We can't keep murdering people. We can't keep committing adultery. We can't keep flaunting the Sabbath. And You know, sure. But I'm saying, come on, we all still make some sins that we do over time. And so that's why Yeshua says... Forgive him. Yeshua makes a point to make a disciple of a tax collector, Matthew, to make a point of, of, of calling commercial fishermen in their crude tongue. Oh, yes. Peter knew how to curse and how to swear. Came out pretty fluently when he denied his Savior. Says he cursed and swore. I don't know that blankety blank man. And Yeshua heard it. Matthew 26. Verse 74, he called the political agitator as one of his disciples. He revealed himself as the promised Messiah to a sinful woman at the well in Samaria in John 4. He revealed himself to a woman, Mary Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. Luke 8, verse 2. Are you getting the picture? He wasn't exactly trying to find the most beautiful people in the world to be his followers, leaders, and disciples. Would you choose a woman out out of whom had come seven demons to be one of your leading followers? And she was a leading follower. She was. She was the first one, even ahead of Peter, to see and touch the resurrected Christ. What an honor. He did not choose the leading men and women of society as a rule. He did not. That's why you're around, folks. Because you're not either, and I'm not. He didn't choose highly respected folks, in other words. No, he did not. Because they thought of themselves too highly for him to be able to use in this life. My point is this. Are you crucifying that part of yourself, and are you reaching out to people who normally you would have been, who normally would have been outside your circle of your daily life? 
Are you becoming more like Christ in that way? Reaching out to people who are trying to change and have a rough background to come out of. All of this was done by our Yeshua, who is now our high priest. In Exodus 28, verses 36 to 38, back to the high priest again. It says, you shall make a plate of pure gold and grave on it the holiness to Yahweh. And you shall put it on a blue cord and on the turban. Exodus 28, back to the high priest Aaron picturing Christ. And it shall be in the front of the turban, holiness, okay? So it shall be on Aaron's forehead that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things. Have you ever read that verse before? It shall be that Aaron shall bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel hallow in all their holy gifts. And it shall be always on his forehead that they, the children of Israel, may be accepted before Yahweh. The word therefore accepted in the Hebrew is rason, meaning accepted, favored, liked. Aaron, picturing Yeshua, is bearing your iniquity of even your holy things, the things you think you're offering to God, like the Sabbath day or your tithes and offerings or whatever. Maybe sometimes you resented having to pay so much tithe or whatever. Or maybe while you're in church services and praying in church services, your eyes open up and you notice something and you have a a bad thought. That Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel hallow in all their holy gifts. Yeshua knows what it's like to be rejected, by the way, and not accepted. He truly understands your rejection. And so he learns to accept people who've been rejected, and he wants you, as part of his body, to start doing the same thing, start accepting people who've been rejected. The difference, of course, if we're honest, is that he did absolutely nothing to warrant being rejected and mistreated, though we have. Scriptures say he was rejected by man. Rejected by man. He's rejected by his fellow Jews, even. You know, Yeshua, Jesus, was betrayed by a disciple whose name was Judas. You know, Judas Iscariot. But, you know, the word Judas, the name Judas, that's a Greek form for, are you ready for the Hebrew name, Judah? Judah. He was betrayed by Judah. How appropriate. How would you feel if you came to your own, your own tribe, and they rejected you? Even his own family members at times said, why don't you go on up? Come on, show everybody your great miracles. Eventually, some of his brothers, like James and Jude, became became, uh, followers. And if the Roman Empire rejected you, if your top disciple not only disowned you, but cursed and swore loudly that he had no idea who you were. And so at the end, you're there on a cross, and everyone has run away except for John, and except for several. There was one man, John, there, and several loyal women. Everybody else deserts you. Thank God for the women. Thank God for you women who are being faithful to Yeshua. The Bible might seem like a man's book to you sometime, but don't look at it that way. The whole, you know, you women are a part of it. It's no longer male or female, it says, okay? So what did Paul mean when he said, I'm crucified with Christ? In context, Paul is discussing the righteousness of God. He, go back to Galatians 2, verse 14, 15, 16. That's given to us. And he was talking about how Peter had played the hypocrite and uh, that he started acting a certain way differently when, when the people from headquarters came from the Jews. So uh, the context was he's talking about the righteousness of God that God gives us. So many people, including maybe some of you, misunderstand uh, understand this. So many can quote Galatians 2.20, but not verse 21, which says, For if righteousness could, be, could come by works of the law, then Christ died in vain. So many don't know the context. The whole context is being crucified with Christ is that in Christ we're covered by him by his goodness, by his righteousness. And we live in him. That's the context. So let's really get this and then come back to Galatians 2. Paul teaches over and over again, our lives as believers must be in Christ, in him. Over and over, Paul talks about it. If you don't understand the concept of in him, 
you're going to miss a lot of the New Covenant, a lot of the New Testament. Okay, so first of all, you all know that we're said to be in him, right? It's easy to understand how God's in us. That's by the Holy Spirit. But it's not so easy to understand how we're in him. Now, follow me on this because it's vitally important. It has to mean something to you or it's more than it's got to be more than just a bunch of words. When you understand the concept of being in Christ, you will understand how you were crucified with Christ and much more. So let's review the concept, first of all. First of all, turn to John 17, verses 21 to 23. John 17, 21 to 23. First of all, Christ came to teach perfect unity. The power of a lot of beings being one in their mind and heart and soul. He said that he and the Father are one. John 10, John 10.30 says that. And yet they were separate individuals. My Father and I are one. Okay, And he also prayed that uh, the, the remaining 11 uh, disciples, uh, he, when he, he prayed this prayer in John 17, that they, all 11 here, Judas had gone already, Judah had gone already, and they may all be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they, he says, I'm in you, Father, and you're in me. I want them to be one in us. How are we going to be one? By being one in Christ, one in God the Father. When we're one in Christ and one in God the Father, that is how we become one in each other. That the world may believe that you sent me. It says again that they may be one as we are one. He's talking about 11 people becoming one. Okay, so when you read about Jesus saying, my Father and I are one, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's not two individuals. Because here he's talking about 11 individuals that they may be one as we are one. And so elsewhere, Yeshua speaks of one body, and we know that that one body is his body. So how do we become one with Yeshua? By joining his body, by becoming a part of the body of Christ. But how do we do that? So let's read it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 14, because this has everything to do with properly understanding how you are crucified and how I am crucified in Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 14, For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members are of that one body, being many are one body in Christ, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all immersed, baptized into one body. That body is Christ, of course. By one spirit, for in fact the body is not one, but many, okay? We're all made to drink of that one spirit, he says. So when God immerses us in the spirit, it somehow makes us a part of the body of Christ. No matter where people meet, if they have his spirit, no matter who they are, if they have his spirit, no matter whether they're male or female, no matter if they have tattoos on their body or not, no matter if they look proper or not, if they have God's spirit... They're a part of the body of Christ, the spiritual body of Christ, and they're in him. That's how we become in him. This is how, by being in Christ, that we can come boldly, and the only way we can become boldly before the heavenly mercy seat. This is how we are in God the Father, for that matter, through Christ. Turn to Colossians 2. This is such a profound concept and explains everything Paul says. He says we're buried in him, with him. We're resurrected in him. We're even circumcised in his circumcision. Paul is saying now that we're in him, everything that happened in the past and is happening now to Yeshua also happened to us, in us. Okay? For we are a part of him. Please get that concept. So in Colossians 2, verses 11 and 12, he even goes so far as to say, in him you were also circumcised without hands, by the circumcision of Christ. Since you're in his body, he says to Gentile uncircumcised Colossians, don't worry about a physical circumcision. You've already been spiritually circumcised by a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ. He's going that far to say this. You understand what I'm saying? And then in Ephesians 2, he takes it even further. In Ephesians 2 and Romans 6, we'll read that. He, and this is how we're 
This is how we're crucified in him, because he was the one crucified, we're in his body. So Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 7. Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 7. I wonder have you, if you ever thought that you that Colossians 2.12 says you were circumcised in Christ. <laughs> and that's what it says. Okay, Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 7. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love, because of his great love with which he loved us. God, the Father, loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, even though we were right in the middle of our sins, he loved us made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together in Christ's resurrection. You were resurrected to newness of life. He made us sit together with Christ in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding richness of his grace. If God could do that someone as bad as Philip Someone as bad as you. Someone as bad as me. That brings him glory to understand that he can transform people no matter where they're coming from. He, We died to him and we were raised in him. You follow what I'm saying? So that's what he's trying to say here. When, and, and being in Christ is such a profound concept. Next, you've got to go to Romans 6. It's pretty cool, isn't it? I think I'm getting really to like this idea of being in him. Own it, brethren. Love it. Understand it. Romans 6, the first, verse, the first 14 verses. I don't have time to read them all, but I want you to study it. What shall I say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because he had just said in earlier chapters that where sin abounded, grace superabounds. No, 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 I'm not saying that. He's saying, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Come on, you guys, we're not going there. We're not going back to the way of sin. Just because we have faith in the righteousness of God that is bestowed upon us as a gift, as he says in Romans 5.17. Now in Romans 6, he says, don't think that means you can go sin. But do accept that it's a gift of God, folks. Romans 5, verses 15 to 20 or 19 or so are just full of that concept. Do you not know that as many of you who were of us who, who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So when you were immersed, he says that's that was picturing that you were buried with him. Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. So Paul is basically saying in Romans six, everything that happened to Christ happened to you. Once you receive the Holy Spirit and are made part of his body. When he died, you died. When he was resurrected, you were resurrected to newness of life. When he was crucified, you were crucified. When he was circumcised, you were circumcised. That's what Paul is saying. And I hadn't seen it quite that way, frankly, before either. Now, verse 8. Okay, verse 6. Knowing this, I'll start in verse 5. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection, Knowing this, that the old man, our old man, our old self was crucified with him. There you have it. Our old self was crucified with him. That the body of sin might be done away with. So Paul is saying, I was crucified with Christ in that once I became a part of his body, my old self was crucified in that as well because he took my sins upon himself now, if we died with Christ, verse 8, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more, and so on. Okay, then he goes on to talk about how we must not let sin have any dominion over our bodies. Verse 11, likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And he says, don't let sin reign. Come on, you guys, don't think that because we have faith in Yeshua that you can just go do whatever you want to do. He, that's not the case. You can't You can't think that way, he's saying. So what Paul is saying here is that he understands that since we are in Christ, it's his righteousness that God sees covering us, not our own. And that was the context of what he was saying about Peter, that why are you trying to make these Gentiles do all the rigmarole of the Old Covenant when you yourself don't do it except when these people from Jerusalem came in? And you know that it's 
that by works of the law, Galatians 2.16, no man, no flesh shall be justified. And so, uh, and so then he says, but that doesn't give us license to sin, but we have to have faith in Yeshua covering us because none of us will make it. There's only one righteousness that will be in the kingdom of God, and that is the righteousness of God himself. Paul says in Philippians 3, 9, I don't even want my own righteousness, which is from the law. I don't want that. I want the righteousness, which is by faith, the righteousness of God by faith through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Okay, Philippians 3, 9. Now, so what happens then? Once you're accepting of Jesus Christ as your Savior, and once you are immersed in the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 1 then says, Therefore, since he took all the wrath that you should have taken because of all of your sins, but now that you're crucified, he took in Christ, he took all of that upon himself, Romans 8, 1, Therefore, there's no more condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, if so, there, don't feel condemned. Don't feel guilty all the time. Don't, brethren, as you come to Passover. This is such a liberating time. It is not a time to be uh, focusing on your sins. It is not. It is a time to be focusing on your Savior. It is not a time to be focusing on your failures. It's a time to be focusing on your crucified and resurrected in Christ. It is not a time to uh, be focusing on your weakness. It's a time to be focusing on His strength. It is not a time to be focusing on your failures. It's a time to be focusing on his victory and oh, how we need this Passover. If the woman caught in the act of adultery five minutes earlier could have heard her master say, neither do I condemn you five minutes or so after her sin, how much more should we be hearing that for sins repented of long ago? And how much more should we be saying that to one another? from ourselves, that I don't condemn you. I certainly can't if God doesn't. So we wash one another's feet because it pictures us accepting that Jesus has washed the feet of the person you're washing. You're saying, I want you to know that I accept that all your sins have been washed by the Master and I'm good with that. I'm washing your feet too. So Paul is saying he wasn't literally crucified with Christ, but he was in Christ. Do you get the vast difference? And since he was crucified, he died. He died. And since Christ was raised from the dead, Paul says the life he now lives was the the new life. Now because of that, because we're in Christ, we're also in God the Father. He says in Colossians 3.3, your life is hidden with Christ in God. So As imperfect as we are, the thrilling thing is I'm even in my Father. Just like Jesus said, he was in the Father and the Father was in him. So am I. And so are you. As bad as you are. If you've repented. As bad as you were. As bad as I was. Even me. I'm in God the Father. Whether you like it or not, I'm sorry, but I'm in God the Father, through Christ my Lord. So, brethren, let's nail down the sins that beset us, and let's take the Passover, let him, let every man examine himself, that he takes the Passover in a worthy manner, and so let him take the cup and drink, and eat of the bread and all of that, okay? It's a positive time of the year, folks. And for the joy that's set before us, we're going to endure the things we have to go through. We're coming up, some, coming up some very, very, very difficult times ahead. And I don't think we have any idea how bad and how difficult it's going to be. But Christ will get us through it, and it'll be fine. As we look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and for the joy that was set before him, endure the cross, we have to do the same thing. That's in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. I started the sermon by imagining you'd had, you know thinking about all these crucifixions. Yeah, we have to be crucified, but we've already been crucified in Christ. Our lives right now can have so much more joy and peace when we understand that we must put the carnal self to death and accept the risen Christ as our Savior. So in the meantime, our lives right now can have so much more joy as we come to Passover. God willing, time permitting, we'll cover more Passover topics in the coming weeks. Be watching the the website. Be aware that I also have a Passover service, okay, already on there that you can play and hear. 
and be watching the blogs that I have there, okay? But be watching the Passover service too, please. Pass the word about this website if it can be, if it can help anybody else you know of. And God bless you, and may he bless you and smile upon you as we come to Passover. Thank you, Abba. Thank you, Yeshua. Thank you for your Holy Spirit.